Okay, I guess it's time to start. This works, right? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Lena Fadring, and I'm going to talk about uh, System DNTPM2 today. Um, yeah, let's uh, jump right in. So, uh, with the stuff that I'm going to talk about, like uh, I want to start out with uh, making clear what the actual goals are with uh, TPM2 support in, in Systemd. Um, <clears throat> Probably want to catch up with other OSs because, like, uh, usually all the other commercial, the big OSs generally default to using some form of Sakya Enclave TPM by default. Generic Linux uh, typically doesn't. I mean, there are some Linux based operating systems which do, of course, but it's usually very focused um, and not available in generic stuff. And if people want to do their own OS like that, um, they have to do major work. And I want to make that a lot easier so that this kind of stuff is just available without much effort and people don't really have to think so much about it. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the goal is to default to measured boot and, and using that for unlocking distance things. Um, uh, uh, I want to go further than just disk encryption. I want to be able to lock any form of secret that we have to the TPM and make that a natural way how you interface with services. Um, there's the goal of secure parameterization. I mean, this is kind of related to what was I was just asking uh, Serge about earlier. Um, yeah, uh, sometimes it's uh, important to be able to parameterize the OS when you boot it, um, and that's a difficult problem because you want to really restrict what you can do there. Um, Contradata computing uh, in focus, they have different requirements. Um, ideally, we would make this uh, as little different as possible. Um, so yeah. Um, and uh, of course, uh, one of the purposes is also to open up the TPM uh, for other purposes than what we in system you want to use it for, so that it generally just works. And there's some semantics on uh, how it's initialized and things like that. Yeah. So uh, the goal really is um, to be ultimately good enough that we can turn on TPM to support by default on generic Linux, um, and not just as an afterthought. So um, let's talk about uh, the current state of uh, what system you can provide with the US uh, right now. So um, basically, I'm just going through the different components in system new that have uh, TPM hookup in one form or another. The first one is, I guess, the most interesting one, which is the, the FTE support, like the, the full disk encryption where system decrypt setup. System decrypt setup is basically just a wrapper around libcrypt setup. Um, but what it does do, it, in, like, it integrates it with the rest of the system, like with the system boot process, for example, with interactivity, um, but also with all kinds of crypto stuff, um, including FIDO2 and PKCS11, and what we like the most interesting thing here is, which is TPM. So uh, yeah, the obvious way is to unlock lux volumes by TPM2. Um, we do it a little bit different than the previous solutions because we actually extend the uh, uh, lacks uh, super block with our data, so it feels a lot more natural because you don't have to have uh, secondary data anywhere else. You don't have to store anything in NV indexes or something like that. Um, it's entirely um, like uh, all information that is needed is included in the lux super blocks and nowhere else. Um, so that's kind of nice. The uh, relevant TPM policies that we actually implement are um, one based around literal PCR values. I'm not sure how useful this is because it's so nasty dealing with literal PCR values. More interesting is the one of the signature with, of PCR values, like the extended authentication thing that was m mentioned in the, in the earlier talk. Um, and the third one is uh, 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 pin-based, so that is then interactive um, during boot. Um, or you can have a combination of these. Um, this uh, system decrypt setup is not just about unlocking things. It, it will also, if you want to, uh, one thing more, which is unlock the, oh, this is annoying, um, the uh, 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 volume key that it just unlocked to uh, PCR15. The purpose of this is uh, that uh, uh, um, we want PCR, I will talk about this a little more a little bit later, but the, the goal of this is basically that we have PCR15 as a way, like. It, it's a hash that represents the identity of the system, if you so will. And if you bind um, uh, TPM objects to that, um, the idea is that this basically means uh, that only that specific um, machine can unlock it and not other machines. Um, there's another tool that's closely related to System Decrypt Setup. It's called System Decrypt Enroll. As the name suggests, it does the other thing. Um, it actually enrolls uh, uh, a TPM with, on a LUX partition. Um, it's not 
much more to say. I mean, you can also enroll a couple of other things like recovery keys, which are probably actually useful in the context of TPM, so that if you have some uh, way to get back into the machine if, you, if TPM stuff didn't work. Um, let's talk about the next component, system DPCR phase. This is about uh, measurement now. It's not about unlocking, it's, it's more about the getting the PCRs in the right state. One component is system, system DPCR phase. The job, uh, the, what it does actually, it's invoked at selected um, places of the boot process and measures certain words into PCR, uh, which one was it, 11? So uh, um, the relevant words are like when systemd first takes over from the kernel, it uh, measures the word en uh, enter initrd into that, and then when it's done with the initrd, it measures the word leave initrd, and so on and so on, and then it's so init and ready basically when the boot up is finished. Uh, why is that useful? Um, this is useful if you bind um, secrets uh, to the value of PCR or to the signature of a value of PCR11, then you can use this to uh, make uh, secrets that only can be unlocked in a certain uh, uh, part of the boot or in multiple uh, parts of the boot, but not any later. Um, this is at the most basic, even if you don't care so much about the, the phases, what's kind of useful is, by the way, that uh, 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 even if you want your keys to be unlockable during the entire boot time, um, at the very least you can say then, yeah, not un anymore un when the system shut down fully. So that's one thing that we do. Um, uh, yeah, so it's really about, um, I mean, some operating systems, they have the concept of destroying the PCR management uh, uh, measure values by measuring garbage into it or something like this. This is really about supposed to be more useful that you can actually pinpoint exactly um, where a, uh, a key shall be unlockable and where it shall not. Um, there's uh, something very closely related, which is systemd PCR machine. It measures um, the machine ID, which is basically just a file in Etsy machine ID, which contains something like a UAD, into PCR15. PCR15, I mentioned earlier already, right? Like this was where the um, volume, root volume key of LUX is also measured into. Um, background is the same thing. Um, we want PCR15 to be a PCR that identifies the system. Now, uh, um, this the system, of course, needs to be somewhat generic, right? Like it's not specific to one use case. It's supposed to be generic for everybody. So uh, uh, if people do not actually use disk encryption or something, then this is supposed to help them uh, to uh, to have an identity anyway, right? Like, of course, with much weaker properties, but that's not really our problem. Anyway, so uh, yeah, PCR15 contains both the root volume key and uh, the, the machine ID. First, the volume key, and then much later, when we actually have access to Etsy machine ID, um, the machine ID. And there, systemd PCRFS also measures into PCR15, and what it measures is actually the file system UUID and type um, of, like, this can actually be instantiated multiple times so if you have multiple file systems. The idea basically is that, yeah, once all three of those things ran, like the system decrypt setup stuff that measures the volume key, uh, system the PCR machine, which measures, basically ma measures the machine ID, and that system the PCR FS, which measures a couple of file system. Um, PCR 15 is basically done, and it can be useful to identify the machine in that combination that it was put together. So that it's uh, definitely going to change if you like install it in any, any different way. Um, these things are enabled by default but only under the condition um, that you're actually booting uh, with a UKI kernel. Uh, the reason, like, we would like to, um, uh, uh, I mean, we would have liked to enable this by default in any case, but, uh, I mean, we take possession of PCR15 with this, right? Where we consider it our own private property once uh, this is enabled, so we wanted a way how people can actually explicitly tell us, oh, we buy into our view of the world, and that's, um, uh, like, yeah, we decided that, yeah, if we detect that the system is booted up with UKI, we do this by default. Of course, by default doesn't mean that you couldn't turn it off. Um, yeah, the, the goal of the PCR15 management is identity of the local system. Um, next thing is the system D stub. Um, was mentioned earlier in the earlier talk because uh, it was forked already. Systemd stub um, is a EFI stub glued in front of the Linux kernel, runs in UFI mode. There's various things, uh, most of them are not really relevant in this context, but one thing it actually does that is relevant in this context is uh, TPM measurement of the components of the UKI. 
The idea basically is uh, this is also done uh, into PCR11. I probably should have mentioned this here. Um, so the, basically, the, the idea is that if you pick a different kernel, PCR11 is, uh, contains in the identity of the kernel. Uh, PCR11 is assumed to be zero uh, when when this stuff initialized. So um, this way, PCR11 is first becomes an identifier of uh, yeah the kernel booted along with its init RD and all the other components. Um, and if, if you remember correctly, the, the PCR phase stuff is also measured into PCR11. Um, so uh, yeah, it encodes both those things, which OS you picked and which uh, uh, phase of the boot you're in. Uh, yeah, this was mentioned in the earlier talk, kernel system D stop in RD, we call that the UKI. Um, oh, I actually did mention the PCR11 thing. So anyway, yeah, so it matters into PCR11. Um, it also matter, it matters the used kernel command line into PCR12. Um, so the, the, the parameterization of the system. Um, to summarize this, these are the relevant PCRs that uh, systemd kind of takes over um, if you buy into the model and use SD stub as, a, uh, as the UKI uh, stub. So first of all, PCR11 contains the measurement of the components of UKI and the boot phases, PCR15, the systemd identity, and PCR12, uh, 12, the, the, the kernel command line. So uh, it's about basically the first thing picks boot phase and OS, the second one system identity, and that is kind of powerful that you can then build complex policies out of this for your, the TPM objects of your choice. So next one is system to measure. System measure actually, I mean, it sounds like it would actually measure something, but what it actually does, it, um, it uh, 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 predicts uh, what the PCR values will be in PCR11, given a specific kernel that is booted and given a specific boot phase, um, is, uh, like the system is currently in a specific boot phase. Um, what's the purpose of this? Um, it's basically that you can build your policies and uh, log arbitrary objects to this. It can not only pre-calculate the PCR values, it can also sign this stuff for you. Um, so, uh, yeah, it currently only focuses on PCR11. We want to extend this, by the way, that it can also uh, predict the PCR values you will see in PCR15 and PCR, what, what was it, 12, um, uh, depending on, on your configuration so that you can uh, uh, do this ahead of time. This is systematically different, like, by the way, how, how grub boots generally work because they put everything in the same PCR, which is great if you are just interested in logs, but it's terrible if you want to predict anything and bind the security to this. Um, with, uh, with systemd measure, our goal really is about like having predictable ways, so that's why we separate out the PCRs um, and, and the purposes of this. Um, yeah, uh, you can use systemd measure to sign the expected values right away, and systemd crypt setup can actually use that information. Um, for the signature-based policy that I mentioned. Um, and there's another tool called UK, UKIFI. I'm, I'm not entirely sure yet how you want to pronounce that, if it's UKIFI or UKIFI or UKIFI. I don't know. Anyway, this little tool helps you building UKIs. Um, so uh, 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 what it actually does, it takes the kernel image, takes the systemd stub, takes an internet ID, takes device tree, whatever else you want, boot splash, and so on and a private key, glues them all together in a PE image, signs them with uh, Secuboot, use a private key for that. It then uh, um, uh, 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 also does the, the, like it invokes systemd measure to predict what the uh, PCR11 value will be once the system is booted up. We'll sign that with another um, signature key, and we'll then also add the signature to the kernel as well. So that the kernel, when it boots up, um, uh, we know what uh, the PCR value is going to be, and the kernel already ships with a signature that matches the expected PCR value, so that when then system decrypts it up, um, uh, uh, runs, it can just take the signature that was passed, that was part of the kernel, and unlock the disk with it. So a net result is basically that you can say, yeah, um, I lock my disk against Fedora kernels, and then you have to boot a Fedora kernel to actually unlock the disk. Um, and you never have to re-enroll anything. The next topic is systemd credentials. Systemd credentials is is not just about TPM. It's basically our way how you uh, can pass um, 
little secrets, certificates, um, private keys, um, but also configuration if you want, into uh, uh, systemd as a whole and into services specifically. And there's a way how you can propagate them, you can inherit them down from the system into uh, specific services. Uh, systemd credentials are actually a powerful concept that people should really start using because you can also pass them in from a hypervisor container manager into the system uh, and then from systemd into the services and then you can pass them on further down to container manager and to, to another VM and so on and so on. Um, systemd credentials um, are very easy for applications to read because it's just a, ultimately they see it as a directory where these files end up in. Uh, but they also have, uh, I mean here, just to mention this, like you can supply them to the system via SM, BIOS, and QMF, W, CFG, and a couple of other things. Um, but the one thing that is interesting in this context here is that they can also be um, uh, locked to the TPM with a symmetric key. Um, the reason why we originally added this is par secure parameterization of uh, EFI, um, like of UK ICE in a, in a secure boot world, because um, yeah, this, this allow listing thing that was discussed earlier is one way out of this, but um, uh, sometimes it's like you want to parameterize in more complex ways and keep the stuff secret, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, we, if you put this information in the ESP, which is unprotected, you need to protect it somehow. So our solution out of this was this. Um, it's actually extremely simple to use. You just say, uh, you'd, like there's a tool called systemd creds, and we just say, I have this little bit of information. We can use it like in a shell, like in a piping thing, and then it does everything automatically for you um, so that people don't even have to think in any way about TPMs or anything like this. Um, you implement similar TPM policies than a script setup, like with the exception of the pin, because it's uh, inherently non-interactive, right? Like the, 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 the goal of this uh, TPM hookup is that it happens at the latest uh, possible time when it's actually needed, um, the, the decryption and authentication of the data, and that happens basically when we start a service. But that also means it can't really be interactive because of course, um, yeah, you don't want to boot up your system interactively, presumably. Uh, I mentioned this already, systemd creds is a tool how you can actually create these things. Um, all of systemd's uh, various components uh, can nowadays deal with systemd credentials. It's actually kind of nice because you can securely supply SSH keys and, and things like that um, uh, through this and yeah. Um, to be more specific, in unit files and systemd service files, you can use set credential, load credentials, and set credential encrypted to set these um, uh, credentials, and it just does the TPM stuff behind your back. You don't really have to care about that. Um, yeah, use cases for the credential stuff is secure parameterization of systems and services. Can be a replacement for things like cloud ins and clouds. Um, and uh, yeah, OS installers can parameterize UKIs. It kind of already said all that. Next thing is systemd repart. Systemd repart is a, I like guess, like a, a, a declarative um, a repartitioning tool that can run at boot and add partitions that otherwise are not there. Why is this relevant in the TPM um, context? That's because uh, um, it can uh, uh, create partitions and automatically link, like encrypt them and link them to the local TPM and roll them there. The use case for this is basically that you ship uh, an OS as a uh, Verity image Right, basically just a slash user petition, and then on first boot, a root file system is dynamically created. The user thing is, um, the user petition is basically mounted into it, and the system boots up. And in that case, um, this has a major benefit that the root file system is inherently local, and all the secrets to unlock it remain inherently local um, between the TPM and the host. Um, so you do not ever have to provision any of these secrets. They are generated locally. And it's also kind of nice because it adapts to local sector sizes, local disk sizes, and things like that. So, yeah. Um, declarative, non-destructive, automatic partition tool. Non-destructive basically means you can't really do anything bad with it. It's the only thing that you can do with it is growing partitions and adding partitions. Um, that's really it. Um, yeah. The key really is that the, uh, like the main point is that the, all the key mater material to lock down such partitions is uh, generated locally and locked to the TPM. Yeah, the use case I already um, described. So 
Um, this was the, uh, trying to give an overview um, like what we currently have. This has holes everywhere. And this is like the holes is what the rest of the talk is going to be about. But maybe it makes sense like if anyone has a question right now, um, we can answer that. Otherwise, I would just continue with all the shortcomings and all the white uh, space uh, that still needs to be filled in to actually build a proper secure system. So anyone, no one has a question? Was my talk that good or? <laughs> Everybody's just confused. Anyway, so let's talk about the shortcomings because there, there are many of those. I mean, by the way, I'm not a cryptographer. I'm not a TPM guy. I'm struggling reading all the TPM specifications like everybody else. Um, I try to talk to the right people though and figure out what to distill out of them, what actually makes sense in the general case. I also talk to the Windows people, by the way. I work for Microsoft in case this wasn't clear. Uh, what they're actually doing, um, they do different things, by the way. Um, like, for example, like this is mostly for historical reasons, I guess, because the, when they designed this, this TPM stuff in Windows, it was still TPM 1.2 was a thing, and you had, didn't have um, uh, what's EA, some enhanced authentication stuff, so you couldn't sign PCR values and things like that. And that, of course, forces them into certain other ways, like massively other ways. Uh, and we have the luxury of coming light in this get, uh, way so that we can rely on, on uh, uh, signing PCR values and don't really have to uh, do all the really, really messy stuff. But anyway, um, it's, it's uh, very difficult uh, from all the people who do things with TPM distilling what we actually want in the general case, in the generic case, because that's what I care about in the system. I don't want the, I don't care about so much about specific uh, solutions for specific uh, uh, projects or something. I want the, the general stuff that works for, uh, maybe not for all, but for a large part of the community. Anyway. Let's talk about the shortcomings. Uh, one of the major things is that uh, we took possession of PCR 11, 12, and 15 for the purposes that I just described, but, uh, um, and we know that they're zero initially, at least if you boot a regular shim style boot, but precisely that's the problem. Because they're zero, um, any other user space can, uh, uh, um, like any other Linux can basically boot up and they're also zero and they can measure the exact, exact same stuff into it that we do without actually like just making it up basically and could unlock secrets with that. Um, so to lock this down we probably would have that shim probably should measure like uh, something identifying the payload it's about to start during boot up into all the PCRs that otherwise aren't used. Um, the effect of that would basically be that if you use a different, um, like if you boot a different OS, you can be sure that the PCRs will be different and that would be block this thing down. This is a major security hole, I guess, in a way. Um, it goes away if you don't care about uh, shim and just enroll everything into the, into the um, uh, UFI uh, chain directly, the, the key ring, the, the DB and, and things like that. But as long as people want to use shim, we probably should address that. Um, it's a, it's a big one, I think. Um, uh, the other one is uh, we currently don't keep a measurement log. I mean, we do log everything, even in structured form, to, to the journal, like to this log. But uh, there is, like, I mean, for the, for the stuff that happens during UFI, um, like all the measurements, there's the UFI measurement log. So you can actually argue about what happens. Um, like so far, we don't have anything comparable to that. Um, we get away with this because, like, for us, everything's predictable, and our goal is not so much about um, like arguing about what happened, but more about uh, unlocking secrets um, and hence predicting of what's going to happen. Uh, but we probably should address that. Um, I think sooner or later we probably want to implement something like the TCG canonical event log format, which is like the spec from TCG. Um, but I'm not sure how much has the community actually bought into this so far, like if there's actually a tool set that people actually use to parse this. As I understand, the, the event log form is actually pretty close to what UFI uses, and it's just um, an extension for user space for this. But anyway, um, maybe, I, I mean, I, I figure we should do that um, so that people can actually come at arbitrary times and, and, and yeah, argue about what's actually happened there. Another shortcoming is asymmetric, asymmetric unlocking. Right now, um, like uh, it's always modeled that you lo enroll locally and you unlock locally. But uh, for various use cases, um, that's probably not what you want. Um, but instead, you want to 
encrypt it on one machine and then unlock it on another. For that, as asymmetric unlocking would be useful. There's actually a patch now that uh, does this. Um, it's a work in progress, uh, but hopefully we'll have that. Um, yeah, the, the goal would then ultimately be that some orchestrator can prepare images um, for one specific host. Only that host can unlock it because it is the only one knowing the private key to it. Um, and that enables a lot of things. It's like the confidential computing people want this kind of model um, because they then can precede the TPM, the virtual TPM they give to the confidential computing stuff and then um, can be sure that only the VM can unlock it. Another issue is robot protection. I think this was also measured in the, uh, mentioned in the earlier talk, um, right? Like uh, uh, this stuff allows you to bind uh, full disk encryption and encryption of uh, credentials to uh, like uh, the vendor of a, of, a, of a series of UKIs, but uh, uh, there's no protection against taking a really old kernel that happens. Like for example, if Fedora would start signing UKIs with the Fedora key, um, there's nothing stopping you from using the UKI from uh, 10 years ago and trying to unlock even if it's like, entirely insecure. So uh, we need to look into that. I have some ideas about um, how this will work uh, with NV indexes um, and things, but uh, this hasn't happened yet. But it's definitely something we absolutely should do. Um, yeah. Uh, the next one is uh, what happened here? Uh, um, this one's a biggie. Um, so for what I've just described about, uh, uh, so far, it works really nicely if you have uh, a, a specific system, like for example, a VM, because uh, that's a very controlled environment and you can enroll all the secure boot keys in to natively directly into the UFI keyring, everything's great. The problem is once uh, um, people want to do things on general PCs, uh, things become much more complex because suddenly uh, things are not closely defined anymore, but people can extend their systems with um, boot ROMs and whatnot, um, and uh, firmware updates and what, uh, everything else, uh, which makes it really hard to bind policy to, because uh, like half of these, um, uh, these, these, I mean, because they always are reflected PCR changes, um, and there is no signature scheme for that. Um, so what Windows, for example, does, it binds it to, uh, binds, uh, um, uh, uh, it's like a bit locker to um, the literal PCR values and then tries to predict when they're going to change. Um, they cannot predict everything, right? Like because some of the changes just happen behind the back. So they have uh, also a way how they can turn off basically the binding to that. I'd rather not, yeah, this is, this is messy, right? Like because on current PC systems, there's simply no way how to make this beautiful, right? You have to deal with the fact that there's no signature scheme available. You have to, to, to work against that. Um, yeah, the way um, I think we should address this, like we have to address this sooner or later if, we, if this truly should become generic and people don't really have to think about this. Um, the way I want this to work sooner or later is, yeah, if we expect a, like I, I don't really want to go into, into that game of predicting uh, what uh, what the PCR values are going to be because that basically means you have to parse through the, the UFI measurement log and then figure out like which are going to be the parts of it that are going to be replaced by a firmware update or bootloader update and then uh, put, putting the new stuff in there and calculating everything. This sounds so terribly fragile and I'm, you know, if uh, the Windows people can do this, I'm not sure if I want to maintain anything. Like, this sounds terrible, uh, terribly fragile to me. In particular, as it's never going to solve the whole problem because some things they simply cannot uh, predict and then they turn off the protection anyway. So I want to come to a way how we can uh, basically uh, bind um, uh, 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 full disk encryption or whatever you want to bind to. Um, some public key that who's, where the private key is actually stored in the TPM locally. And then uh, I'm kind of trying to come up with a scheme where we can uh, then for one boot only uh, basically uh, uh, um, generate, like sign a different EA policy that is loser but only applies on the next boot and then for the subsequent boot um, doesn't work anymore. So basically that you have a system where you can basically say, okay, for the next boot, I'm gonna turn off um, the, the PCR zero to four and seven um, uh, binding. And then uh, you reboot 
and then uh, we immediately bump the counter or something that protects all this to be disabled um, again. And uh, before that, we uh, looked at what the actual PCR values are, and those are the ones that we bind to. I'm not sure. Like this is very vague. It's not surprising it's awake because this stuff doesn't exist. I just have ideas um, and uh, we actually have to implement them first. But uh, I think this is a really nasty problem and I, I'm not aware of anything in, in, in the Linux world would even remotely try to address this for the general case. Um, uh, not last missing feature, which is like really pff, a complex one. I don't know what any of this means in the context of KXEC or user space reboot. Well, let's say, like, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think I, I know what the right approach to that is, right? Like, because some people say, yeah, just don't measure anything more on the second uh, KX sec or something. <laughs> Sounds like uh, chickening out um, to me. Um, uh, you know, the clouds, they love KXEC because of gray out time. So I think we have to do something about this. Uh, my current thinking is probably we just want to continue measuring stuff as we always did. However, we probably should add a way how selected secrets that actually need to be handed over are handed over by some path tied to the TPM expecting what the VCR values are going to be after the KXEC and then be unlocked there. So basically what I'm saying is that I think it needs to be a different way how we pass over the secrets and not be um, uh, enrolled in the super blocks of locks, for example. But anyway, this is, <laughs> I don't know, if anyone has a clear idea what we actually should be doing in case of KXEC and user space reboot, um, I'm all ears, uh, but this is like, yeah, we, really have to think about this because this is, as it appears to me, seems to be like very soon the common case how clouds reboot. So, uh, yeah. Um, so much about the shortcomings. I hope you can understand they are major. And then particularly ma major if, you, if we think about PCs, like actual random systems that people want to um, uh, install systems on, but if you have a uh, non-PC, like if you know your hardware, um, and particularly if you if you run things in a VM, I think it should already be pretty comprehensive and you can build things uh, uh, locked down. Um, uh, any comments at this point? How much time do I actually still have? Like what's now? Oh, I just only spoke half an hour or something. Anyone has a question? There's a question. Well, the, the microphone. I have, I have a comment. So on the missing feature F, you probably also need to look at uh, crash kernels, so crash dump kernels. Well, but I mean, like, if you have a crash kernel, then everything's, like, you're fucked anyway, aren't you? Yeah, but you still need to be able to boot it. But I, I, yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, definitely. Um, but I'm, does it need to see? I, 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 it sounds to me like it's like the, the, the ten step and the nine and before that are all missing. So um, uh, uh, we probably have to address those first. Um, I don't like the crash kernel has magic about like powers about anyway, right? Like you can look into the first kernel, right? Yeah, you might need to lock down what it writes in some way. But... Anyway, yeah, it's, just, it's it's a mess. But I, I would rather not think about that yet. Let's first get the clean code paths in order, and then we can think about the, what happens in the exceptional code path. But uh, anything, any other questions? Somebody in front of there. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, uh, this can all be quite messy. Uh, <laughs> uh, one thing, uh, so you have asymmetric uh, encryption coming. Uh, are there any other uh, features on the horizon to support confidential computing that that uh, uh, you're aware of. Uh, um, there, like the con like uh, I'm actually in regular meetings with confidential computing people. I'm not one myself though, but uh, they are trying to uh, um, make it work and they have sending like I think at least three PRs open that I still have to review. 
Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. But I mean, the confidential computing thing, like there are multiple different f uh, uh, factions, like uh, groups of people who have different goals with confidential computing, right? Like some of them want to run proper VMs with a virtualized TPM and things like that. That's probably very much in scope what, what we are doing. But then there's the other group of people who do confidential computing where they just basically run something like a Qatar containers thing, like uh, inside of them. Well, all of this is entirely irrelevant, but they still like the, the it's not that binary. They like nobody knows what's actually going to happen. I, I don't know. But uh, yes, there's lots of stuff uh, coming, going, and like for example, the measurement of the volume key, the measurement of the UID is actually explicitly from a request by Red Hat confidential computing people. So um, I don't know. Yeah, we, we try to distill out of what they want, and uh, uh, when it's in focus for us, we definitely want to add this. And yeah, there's some some stuff uh, pending. I'll take a look at the PRs. Yeah, well, uh, reviews always very welcome. <laughs> any other questions at this point? I can't believe that no one has any questions. I mean, I only have one slide left, so uh, you really have to ask questions because otherwise I don't know what I'm going to talk about. This is a bit different, uh, I suppose, question. Uh, but what does Microsoft want with in, in, in its system? Like, why do they care about System D since it doesn't run on their platform? Of course it does. It does? You know, I think we, how many Linux distributions do we have, um, James? <laughs> um, we have one that is uh, public, um, Mariner, and we also have internally, we uh, have an embedded operating system that's used. But we have. The infrastructure, and there's. Um, there's more than that, right? Yeah. Anyway. But we also support, um, you know, sorry about my one, <laughs> Microsoft's one. Yeah, so we also support a lot of uh, what is used, but yeah, I don't want to get into marketing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of Linux use. So um, I think it's public knowledge by now, like in Azure, like there is some component that runs Linux heavily and it's all systemd stuff. Um, and basically it checks all the boxes of what system you offer. That's the reason why I work for, for them. But yeah, and there's multiple other projects that also do systemd stuff. So these when, are Microsoft is a Linux company now. <laughs> um, any other questions? No, I can't believe it. Like, I, come on, this is the, like the short comic was supposed to be something that get you all started and give me ideas like how to address this stuff. But okay, the the only last thing that I have is something uh, that we have more short questions. I'm sure. Um, what are the changes for Linux distros to implement? secure installation? Oh, wow, that's a good question. Yeah, that's good. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, like, the first thing is probably to adopt UKIs, right? Like, because UKIs, like, right now, like, how classic dis Linux distributions, regardless if it's Ubuntu or Fedora or Debian, how they boot is that they don't protect the init RD. I mean, this was also on your slides before, right? Um, and that's just a stupid idea, right? Like, so, uh, um, the first step is that they fix that hole. Um, various distributions are um, have gone past there. Some are further ahead and others are not so uh, far ahead. I know that the Arc Linux people have something that's pretty close to working and the Fedora people with the next release, they'll have it as an option that you can boot UKIs. Um, and the confidential computing part in Fedora even has it already, like they, they actually go that way. If you have the UKI stuff, um, then this enables all the other stuff. Um, there is no discussion yet. Like for example, I think that uh, probably on TPM systems, the root file system by default should just always be locked to the TPM. And then if you want some other kind of uh, locking as well, you probably should enroll something in addition to it, right? Um, or replacing it, but um, I think the, 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 the default for modern operating systems would at the, at the most basic should be non-interactive TPM enrollment, but uh, this discussion has not started yet because, because the, the way like reworking everything to be UKI based is just a massive effort because they currently, they have to rebuild everything because um, right now everything is built around like InterRD generators that are inherently local to the system. And if they move this um, to pre-build them on on uh, central servers, um, on the on the build servers of the OS, uh, that's, that's basically puts everything from from the, the head on its feet, and that's just yeah. Anyway, so things happen bit by bit. Um, 
That said, I know that the Arc Linux people are uh, way ahead and uh, are doing things better there, but I'm not sure that I don't think they have anything on by default uh, in this regard. But it's definitely my intention to do this, but I have no illusion this will take ages. And one, like Debian and these very conservative distros, I don't think we'll see that in this decade or something. But I mean, in particular, certain communities still have this, I don't know, um, ideas about TPMs being evil, terrible Microsoft stuff that destroys open source or something. And uh, uh, that's, yeah, that's not going to happen anytime soon, I guess. But yeah, it's definitely my interest, though, that general purpose distributions sooner or later switch to this. And uh, we're getting very positive feedback from uh, some of them, at least. Um, in particular, Fedora. As soon as people do something there. Um, uh, Arch Linux people do something there. Ubuntu people have for the the embedded version of Ubuntu, whatever that was called, like Ubuntu Core, um, do some things in this area, but I don't think they have switched to the systemly way of uh, doing things. Uh, well, yeah, we'll see. Any other questions? Questions? That's a good question. Somebody doing a question. Not a question, just just a comment. I, I don't think you had mentioned it. For the, for the KXEC issue, we've all had that thought too, of course. Uh, the only, I mean, we don't want to mess with the TPM at that point, so the only thought we've had is you, you take your credentials that you have at that point, your secrets, put them in a uh, temporary initRD, a one-time use initRD, and pass that along to KXEC. Um, I assume you've had that thought too, but... Yeah, but I mean, I'm 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 kind of of a believer that the secrets should better stay in the TPM that as long as possible. Would so be better, yeah. I'd I'd rather have them like like pass them over in, in like some TPM locked form that, however, is unlockable at the right point after the KXEC comes. And uh, the question is simply, how do we define that? I'm I'm pretty sure like the PCR phase concept, like that where we measure all these words into this, this probably might suffice because um, then you can basically during shutdown generate a new uh, TPM con like uh, encrypted container that says yeah you, the words shutdown and final have been have to be measured and then the words for the booting up of the next system have to be measured, and then it can be unlocked until ready or something, until the boot process is, is, is done or something like this. So I think we can, we, well, we have uh, things like that, and uh, we have to look into this, um, uh, that this can just work. But yeah, I mean, so the point that I was, was making, uh, trying to make earlier is I think we probably want to re-encrypt basically every time we are about to KXEC um, the data we actually want to path. Um, instead of uh, having everything unlockable, not only during the first boot, but also during the late ones, if you follow what I mean, right? Like, I think we should constantly only do it when we know that we're coming back, because otherwise you basically unlock it for everybody always. So just thought, and maybe this is where you're going with that, but um, I believe those PCRs, um, I think you can reset those. You can reset your... exactly two or something. Okay, I thought, yeah, it's it's been a couple of years, so my memory could be fuzzy on this, but I thought, uh, what are you using, 15, 11, and 12? Like, we use, actually we use one more, but I didn't want to go into detail. But okay. yeah, but there there is one resettable. I mean, once they are resettable, they kind of lose the magic properties that you can, can't go back well, with, right? But here's what I'm getting at. I mean, if you want to treat KExec, at least from a TPM perspective, similar to how you would if you were a, a cold boot, um, basically, when your when the initial kernel or whatever kernel n is, you basically, like you said, when you get to that final, like the last thing it does before it unloads the TPM driver, is it's going to reset those PCRs that that you care about, and then it basically is in the same state more or less that the system would be when it was warm booting, and basically have that kernel act as whatever you're going to have your bootloader or the stub that's in the UKI basically have that then I kick mean, in for the KXEC. But how do you protect the, that, that, I mean, if you allow PCRs to be reset that way, relevant PCRs, like how do you protect that nobody else resets it for you? Well, but you listed that as another problem which you're going to have to solve. 
<laughs> right? I mean, that was, I think, the first problem you mentioned. So, I mean, you're going to have to come up with a solution for that anyway. Yep. And so if you solve that problem, then you should basically have it solved in this case as well. I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I, come, I came to the conclusion that probably k exec reboots are inherently different from the first one, right? Because uh, uh, you can pass information around and things like that. And we probably should take benefit of the fact that they are different and then have like not try to well, too hard to reset everything to the original way. Th there's benefits to be had, yes, agreed, but you don't have it working yet. No, so we don't. maybe maybe you know start off with it. But, saying but again, it doesn't I'm have sure, to be different. I'm pretty sure that's exactly one PCR that you can reset, like which yeah, is uh, the debug one or something. It's possible. Like I said, I could be mistaken. It's been a few years. Um, so are you required to just do SRTM or would you consider like DRTM? So DRTM is what like, would give you PCRs that you can reset in a controlled way and then redo measurements in a controlled way. And so with a K-exec, you could basically reset it to a known good system. You run your DRTM code, you know that you're coming out of it in a known good state and you can verify those measurements and go forward. So I'm aware of DRTM, but uh, it's hard enough to get this far, right? Um, um, it's like uh, you, the, the, the DRTM stuff, as far as I know, it's, 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 it's like you still need special bootloader and everything uh, for things like that. I think it's like, um, you know, I already list like um, six major issues that we have to address first. Um, once we come to that point, like the KXEC one is probably the least of, of, of the things that I want to actually address first. Um, uh, so, yeah, but sure, I have it somewhere um, in focus, but also, um, I, 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 you know, I'm not a TPM guy or, or anything like this. I, it's not the world that I come from. I'm, I'm a user space OS guy, basically. So uh, um, don't put too much pressure on me to just buy into all the newest fads that there are. But I'm pretty sure we sh yeah, I mean, if, if this stuff comes along and becomes usable and me as an idiot can make use of it. Absolutely, we should hook this up. But uh, um, for now, I guess uh, we probably should fix the, these problems first. It's, I guess a matter, matter of priorities. Uh, how much time do I still have left? Okay, very good. I mean, I only had one slide left, but it's only the Outlook thing, which I wanted to show if I have nothing else to say. So that's good. <laughs> so thank you very much.